So I'm, I'm originally from Helsinki, so I'm, I'm simultaneously translating everything from Finnish to English as I speak. So, um, but a lot of people back in Helsinki would, would assume that I've got a Scottish name for some reason, because it sounds a bit like a whiskey or something. Um, right. So um, I'm the digital experience director at Siegel and Gale. Siegel and Gale is a brand strategy agency founded in 1969. Um, so I work mostly with um, uh, the digital applications of um, brands and every, everything that that, that um, holds, holds in it, because brands are not just logos and jingles, but, uh, but also complete experiences. Uh, and what I'll be talking about today is aliens, because um, I was completely misinformed of what this is about. No, I'm kidding. Um, so aliens as pertains to uh, that we are all aliens to each other in, in the way that, well, like a lot of people have today said that we can't assume anything about each other. We all behave differently, and especially if you follow some of the uh, some of the uh, talk on social media, uh, you just can't understand, you know, where these people are coming from and if they're coming from, a, from the same planet at all. Um, but that we can, we can find what the simple truth um, or, or what kind of simple message we can get across to people if we just uh, look, at, look at people's behavior and, um, and understand where it's stemming from. So, um, oh, I suppose I should have a clicker. Oh, there we go. Right. So, um, Siegel and Gell's uh, mantra is uh, simple is smart. And that's um, what we've founded the whole company on, simplicity uh, and bringing that, that message over in, in everything we do, and um, it's not, and, and when I talk about simplicity, it's not just minimalism, taking away things, um, but it's, it's finding that, that core truth, something, something that resonates in people, that, you know, it can't just be a simple message, it should be something that you feel is, oh yes, that is true about them, um, be, it, be it how banal um, ever, um, whatsoever. Uh, and, um, and we work with uh, all aspects of the brand, like I, like I said. We have a, a dedicated research and insights team. Uh, we have uh, proprietary research methods. We have our own naming department, whose only job is to come up with names for products and brands. Um, a really cool, cool job. Uh, and of course, visual, visual design, um, digital implementation, um, and, and all, of, all of that that you see right there. So, uh, uh, I want to start off with a case that was based very much on, on the research that we did. So this is uh, McLaren, a uh, British uh, supercar slash sports car brand. How many have, mm, uh, have heard of McLaren? Good, that's more, more hands than not. Um, and um, so McLaren had, had the challenge of, uh, of wanting to increase or triple their sales, uh, which is mostly done through dealers. And of course, because it's, it's an amazingly expensive car, uh, you know, you have to target very certain types of people. Now, the problem was finding who these people actually are. Uh, and it's, um, and, and you, at first would think that it's, of, oh, you know, and this is when, when we asked the dealers, the, the dealers of McLaren's on, you know, what, what are the customers like? Well, what are they after? And they would list like, you know, that they're after performance, uh, they're, they're after, you know, looks and, and being flashy and, and making an impression um, and all of that. But, um, but then when we, we asked the owners of, of um, supercars and sports cars, the, uh, the, the results we got were that, uh, sorry, when, when we asked the general public, was that, that they pretty, pretty much just said that, well, they know the Formula One team and they, they know the heritage. And then we asked the supercar and sports car owners uh, what it is that, that people aspire to with, um, with these cars and, 
and then how do they, how do they actually behave? And, and what sets McLaren apart? What is, what is that unique truth for, for them? Uh, and I don't know, some, some people might be wondering what's the difference between a supercar and a sports car, but um, when uh, we were, the first thing that people um, think of with, with supercars is that they are, uh, well, fast and red and um, streamlined and aerodynamic and maybe have some horses in the logo, and they're Ferrari. So uh, this, this was, was a problem um, because uh, a lot of, of what the dealers were doing were act actually trying to, you know, they were sort of selling Ferraris to people that should be buying McLarens because they couldn't, couldn't really set it apart and see what was, what was the difference between a, a Ferrari and a McLaren. And then there are the sports cars, which again are, um, more black and silver, German, um, also have, have horses in, in, in their logos and basically their Porsches. So, so you've got these two brands, um, the dealers of McLaren, when they're talking with their customers, they can't really make a difference. Well, how does, how's this different from a Ferrari or a Porsche? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's a McLaren, it's British. Um, so after, so we did. We uh, used a proprietary technique called eye opener, and um, and found out what, what kind of attributes people were were attributing to to Ferrari and then to Porsche, and seeing what, what the overlap there was, and um, and we also looked at at how how McLaren owners behaved compared to to these these ones and what they thought of Ferrari owners, and and what comes up is that uh, McLaren owners view Ferrari owners as Kind of dodgy celebs, right? So you've got uh, kind of um, you've got Lindsay Lohan, Kim Kardashian, and um, Justin Bieber there with their Ferraris, uh, and then as opposed to to Porsche, um, McLaren owners would see them as as like these you know kind of uh, above average income dentists and, and lawyers who, uh, who maybe are going through a middle age crisis and, and then got a Porsche to, to, I don't know, impress someone else, not their wife. Um, and so yeah, back to being serious a bit. Um, so supercar owners had all of these traits that, that, you know, that a lot of McLaren owners had um, and Porsche owners, you know, were also about advanced technology, but the thing that we found was that supercar owners were uh, focused on the experience, uh, on on the looks, uh, on on the on the flash of the car. Sports car owners more on on um, on how how it made them feel. Whereas McLaren owners were the kind that you know they didn't want to be photographed in their car, but they were more the type of people who would get out of their car and let kids take pictures of their supercar, um, but they were after drivability and, you know, they were gearheads. They were clearly people who just wanted to talk about motors and horsepowers and, um, and, uh, and had a real feel for the heritage of McLaren. So the unifying truth was that McLaren was serious about drivers and this set it apart from the Ferraris and the Porsches. And, and was also the basis for the whole brand platform afterwards. Um, to, uh, to put drivers at the center, to prepare, commit, and belong. And, um, and then they, they created their whole, whole brand based on, or, or redesigned their whole brand based on that. And I'm gonna show you a, a, a minute and a half long video. Hopefully you guys will have the patience to, to watch it, but it's, it's testosterone filled. So, so let's, so I'll hopefully keep everyone awake.
boom. So, um, so basically what they did was they understood who their community were. So, you know, you had Jeremy Clarkson there, you had serious drivers, you had the heritage, um, and it was all about the drivers. So, um, our thesis is that simplicity is the ultimate driver of, of brand loyalty, and uh, whereas complexity drives indifference. And we, um, if um, Maria is still here, but uh, we did a, a study with um, SAP and uh, Shift Thinking. Uh, this was this was published in the Harvard Business Review, uh, where we where we um, interviewed 5,000 people and um, and divided brands into um, purchase brands, uh, which concentrate more on on the moment before you purchase it. So advertising, um, the research phase. Um, and they were brands that you, you would look up, look up to, that was the direct quote, versus then you have the usage brands which focus on uh, advocacy, loyalty, the moment after purchase, which is the usage. So, um, all right, let's have another, another show of hands. Um, who would rather be in this group? And who would rather be in this group? Yeah, and there's something about these brands that, you know, they, these, they both sell lemonade, right? They both sell razors, but, but there's something that about uh, Monzo, for example, that people can't shut up about it when, when they own one, and it's getting really annoying, <laughs> or Tesla, for, for that matter, um, or with Airbnb. It's always, you know, the Airbnb is the experience. Hilton is, Hilton is classy, it's a good hotel and, you know, um, but you won't really tell your friends about, you know, I was just at the Hilton. <laughs> Where's everyone going? All right. So, um, and continuing off of this, we, we have, um, so at Siegel and Guy, we, we publish uh, an index every year called the, well, it was called the Global Brand Simplicity Index. Uh, now it's called the World's Simplest Brand Index. So. Um, and we have a new one coming out in just a couple of weeks. Uh, but we have taken um, almost a thousand brands um, and surveyed 14,000 people in nine different countries around the world, different continents, uh, and asked people, you know, what is their feeling on the simplicity versus the complexity of, of these brands uh, based on comms, based on experience, um, and, and that general feeling. And we noticed that 64% of people preferred, or were willing to pay more. Of course, they preferred them, but they were also willing to, to put a premium on these simpler brand experiences. Um, and then, and even more important, 61% would, um, would, would advocate them to others. And that, that is super valuable. Now, you might be wondering, what are these simple, simple companies here, the top 10 simple brands in the UK for 2017. Um, can't reveal 2018 yet, um, or I might if you come and talk to me afterwards. Um, and so you have, and, and this isn't really a surprise, but you have like Amazon uh, there at number one. Um, but then you've also got like the like Little and Haldi, and you understand immediately that, yes, they are simple, but they're not very glamorous though. They're not, um, uh, you know, they're not, I don't know, Ferrari, right? So, um, so what they are, they're, they're kind, of, kind of mundane, right? So, uh, and they, they, uh, they're, they're not necessarily brands that you have a super strong relationship with, but they are brands that deliver and are immediate and, uh, and, um, and also are, are great in digital channels and, and social media as well. Uh, of course, it matters very much on what industry you're in. So if, if you're a, um, an internet search company, you get, get, tend to, to be much simpler than uh, utilities, for example. Uh, but yeah, like, the kind, like Premier Inn, for example. You know, that, it, that, that's a brand that you know, you're going to get consistent uh, value from, um, from a brand like that. 
um, that, that you understand immediately what it stands for and what you're going to get from them. And, um, and that, that is something that, you know, brands should aspire to because the, the customers tend to go that way when they have that uh, need to, to use um, a service. Right. So, uh, so simplicity follows understanding behavior then. That when you understand that people just want that product brought to your doorstep right away, you understand that you, that's what you should be concentrating on, making the experience more simple. Um, instead of uh, just engagement in general. Because looking at what, what are the kind of things that uh, create the most engagement. Now, there's a, there's a, there's a thing that people you have used billions of hours of time, time on, and uh, that's this one. So, um, uh, anyone who plays this? Anyone who has played this? So it's Candy Crush Saga, and I'm a really sad person because I still play it. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so pe people actually have, have used like, um, have played 1 trillion, 1 1.1 trillion rounds of this since the launch in 2012. And, and for some companies, engagement means that they should be like this. They should just get as many minutes of your day as possible. Um, so you have banks creating games like this uh, so that you would just spend more time with the brand when, when that's, that's not necessarily what you want at all. Uh, what, what you need is if, if it's an experience that you just want to be over as fast as possible, like paying a bill or something like that, then it should be done like that, or preferably maybe automatically. Whereas if you have experiences like taking out a mortgage, then you might actually want to spend more time with an actual human being and you know, have a cup of tea, talk about it, consider you know, um, how it's going to impact your life. So understanding your experience is crucial. Which gets me back to E.T., if anyone remembers that anymore. <laughs> um, a great reference from 1982. So, um, so E.T., um, uh, as you know, is an alien, and that's how, how we should th treat, our, treat our users, um, not taking them for granted, not assuming anything about them, but listening to what they have to say. And what did E.T. have to say? Well, E.T. wanted a phone, uh, which is the product here. Um, and, but that is, that is not what you are selling. E.T. didn't care about the phone. E.T. cared about home. Ah. <laughs> and, uh, and that was his, um, or her, ultimate need um, to get home. And that is, that is what, uh, what companies should be selling. Should be selling home instead of, of just their product, because that is where E.T. was going. And us too, as these aliens on our voyage through this life. Thank you. <laughs>